Hey y'all, Data Guy here, back with yet another viewer request video. Um, and this time, I'm going through a best practices guide for how you can implement best practices for security and compliance as a data engineer. So I'll go through a number of different, you know, kind of frameworks around data classification, access controls, encryption, compliance frameworks, data privacy, best practices, and practical advice that you can use to implement and make sure that you're designing with these principles in mind at all times, because it's a lot easier to design it first with these in mind than go back and fix it all and make it all compliant later. So if you like these videos, please like, subscribe, it helps me out a lot. And without further ado, let's get into it. So the first thing you're going to want to think about when you're a data engineer and you're focusing on, hey, how can I be secure and compliant? great idea is to start with a data classification framework. Um, and this establishing a clear data classification framework allows you to you know, identify, organize, and protect sensitive data appropriately. But you don't want to protect all of your data with the same level of sensitivity because it can get expensive. So a typical setup will be you know, to define classification levels, like public, you know, information that can be shared freely without risk, internal, information restricted to your organization members, confidential, sensitive business information that requires protection, and then restricted, which is you know, highly sensitive data that requires maximum security controls, think things like you know, passwords or you know, sensitive business data. Um, and the implementation steps you'll want to take to do this is you know, first create data classification policies with clear definitions on what is public, what's confidential, what's internal, what's restricted, with examples as well of each of those types. Then implement automated data discovery tools to help identify sensitive data that you know, meets those, those rules. And then use data lineage tracking to understand data flow and dependencies for all those different data flows. And tag data sets with appropriate classification levels in metadata systems so even as data flows to their systems you can see where you know sensitive or public or internal data might be actually flowing uh, and actually being used downstream um, and then make sure you're regularly reviewing and updating classifications as data usage evolves um, and a great way to accomplish this too is you know establish a data governance structure so establish a data governance committee with clear roles and responsibilities and then define data ownership and stewardship roles across business units with data quality standards and validation procedures and uh, you know things like implement data retention and disposal policies as well and then you maintain comprehensive data catalogs across all of those areas with the security metadata so you always know what level of security a piece of data should be held to now the next thing you're always going to want to implement is role-based access control. Uh, implement robust identity and access management practices to make sure that only you know, the users you want to access sensitive data can. Um, and some core principles here that you want to think about are you know, principle of least privilege, grant minimum necessary access rights, don't just grant global permissions to make your job easier. Um, also, zero trust architecture. Never trust, always verify identity, permissions, things like that upon every action. Um, and then also implement role-based access control. So you have different permissions based on your job functions that are automatically granted to you by whatever job function you're, you're in. And then also think about implementing attribute-based access control as well, um, which is dynamic access based on user, resource, and environment attributes where you know, someone might, a certain role might have access to higher access to a dev environment, but much lower access to a production environment of the same resource. Um, and some best practices here also are going to be you know, implementing things like multi-factor authentication for all data access, use service accounts with minimal permissions for automated process, you know, just scope to what process that service is actually doing, um, and then also regularly audit and review access permissions, implement just-in-time access for elevated privileges, and then also use federated identity management for external partners so you rely on an external identity manager to actually assign and manage and revoke permissions after that user's time is up. Now, the next thing you're going to want to consider are best practices for data encryption, right? And so with data encryption, you want to make sure you're both encrypted at rest and in transit. Um, and generally, AES-256 encryption is the standard for all sensitive data storage. Um, and you also want to do things like implement transparent data encryption for databases and also encrypt backup files and archive storage as well. And then you can use cloud provider managed encryption keys or customer managed keys depending on your level of sensitivity and control that you need for your organization. Um, you also can implement field level encryption for really highly sensitive data elements like passwords or, or uh, things of that ilk, um, but generally it's you know, too expensive to do on every single field. Um, and for encryption in transit, 
Make sure you're using TLS 1.3 for all data transmission. Implement certificate-based authentication for data transfer. Um, and also consider using VPNs or private networks for sensitive data transfers, as well as encrypt API communication with proper authentication. So API, you know, with that message, you're sending the authentication as well, so you can track it. Um, and then also implement message level encryption for pub subsystems. Um, and then finally, for key management here, you're going to want to implement you know, key management best practices to protect those encryption keys that you're using. So using dedicated key management systems services like AWS KeyMS, Key Vault, et cetera, are really useful. Um, you can also implement key rotation policies. Typically, you, know, you want to do that like quarterly for high sensitivity data. Um, and then also separate key storage from encrypted data. You, know, you don't want to store them in the same location. Um, and use hardware security modules for critical keys. And then think about implementing key escrow procedures as well for really, really, for, for high compliance uh, use cases and so you can comply with those requirements. Now, the next thing you want to think about is network security. And network security encompasses a few different things. Um, but primarily, what you're going to want to think about are really, you know, network segmentation and having different data processing environments and different network zones for different data classification levels. Um, so really isolating, you know, different environments to make sure that, hey, if one environment gets breached, it's limited to just that particular environment. Um, and a typical segmentation strategy will be, you know, to create separate network zones, so separate VPNs for different data classification levels. You know, keep all your sensitive data in one VPN, all your public data in another, and so on and so forth. And then you can also implement micro segmentation for container based architectures where each piece of data is its own segment. So each data set could actually be its own segment, but that's kind of an advanced use case. Um, and then for database and sensitive processing systems, making sure you're always using private subnets with no connectivity to the public internet unless explicitly granted through something like a VPN tunnel or the like. Um, and then you'll also want to establish DMZ zones for external facing applications that contain no sensitive data and are really just a front facing skin for your application that obfuscate the actual backend that's doing the secure data processing. And then also doing things like implementing network access control lists and web and DNS filtering and security groups is also really crucial as well. Um, then you'll also want to think about you know, firewall and security controls. So implement your know, next generation firewalls with deep packet inspection, use web application firewalls for API endpoints, um, and deploy intrusion detection and prevention systems to make sure you're identifying and also protecting against any kind of intrusion. Um, and typically, you'll always want to implement distributed denial of service, DDoS protection, anything that's public facing to eliminate that attack vector as well. And then always implement regular vulnerability scanning and pen testing to make sure that you're staying up to date with all the latest scams and penetration uh, that you might be dealing with. Now, the next thing I want to discuss is establishing a data privacy and protection framework. This is really critical, especially when you're dealing with you know, things like HIPAA or GDPR compliance, where you need to make sure that you have a framework that is not only you know, detecting and managing and implementing data privacy considerations, but is also notifying and tracking when you breach those. Um, and here, you want to make sure you're implementing privacy considerations throughout the data engineering design cycle, life cycle, with the core principles of being proactive rather than reactive privacy protection. You want to be actively checking, actively monitoring, and making sure your, your data is private rather than just reactively saying, hey, this is private, and if anyone tries to un access it unauthorized, then I'm going to figure out who that is and block them, right? So privacy should really be the default setting for any kind of sensitive or you know personal data. Um, and you should also have full functionality with privacy protection. You know, even though you are you know making it private, it should still function with the rest of your data engineering lifecycle. Um, and you also want to make sure that you have end-to-end -end security throughout the data lifecycle because if you're only protecting it at one portion of the lifecycle, it'll be exposed and, and you know available and you know non-protected in other areas of the data lifecycle if it's not implemented with data end-to-end -end security for that data. And that's where you know that metadata tagging comes into play to make sure they're constantly being applied. Um, you also want to make sure you have visibility and transparency in data processing, so making sure you know exactly where data is flowing in and out of, so that no unintended flows start to arise where data is sent to systems that aren't under the necessary privacy config configurations. And then also giving any user data, users the option for privacy preferences as well. That's really key to staying in compliance as well. 
Another piece of this is data anonymization and pseudonymization. So here you can use, you know, you want to protect individual privacy while also maintaining data utility. So you know, this here you make data anonymized, but you still protect the underlying data and make it available for data processing. Um, and there's a number of ways you can implement this, you know, with K-anonymity, L diversity, differential privacy, data masking, tokenization. Um, but the key idea there is that you know having if you have data that you need to use and you know need to be able to query and analyze but it's sensitive user data you need to find a way to make that anonymous so that you can use it for those sensitive workloads next you're going to want to be thinking about real-time monitoring continuous monitoring is pretty much crucial to detecting security anomalies and compliance violations so you're going to want to make sure you have a few monitoring components Number one, you know, use your behavior analytics to detect unusual access patterns. You know, someone's accessing your database from an unknown new location, uh, sending alerts based on that. Um, also, data loss prevention systems to prevent unauthorized data exfiltration. You know, making sure that data can only leave through approved pathways. Um, database activity monitoring for real-time database activity or and security, making sure that any queries that are being done within the database are in expected patterns. Um, and then also network traffic analysis for unusual data flows, seeing if data is flowing unusually to any kind of different source than what it usually goes, means there's probably something h h hanky going on there. Um, then you also want to think about you know, application performance monitoring as well with security metrics to s detect things like, hey, a DDoS attack or any kind of you know, degradation in your services. Um, and then throughout all of this, you're also going to want to maintain an audit trail. And what this really means is just, you know, the collection and standardization of all of your logs from all of your different sources so that you have a trail of all actions for compliance or for forensic analysis. Um, and audit trail typically requires, you know, tamper evidence storage with digital signatures, uh, a complete chain of custody for documentation of, you know, where data has gone through, um, and then also regular audit trail integrity verification to make sure that, you know, it is of an expected quality. Um, and long-term retention policies that are aligned with regulatory requirements as well with efficient search and reporting capabilities so that you can easily query that instead of manually going through it because you can imagine doing that uh, is incredibly difficult. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is infrastructure security. If you're doing data engineering today, you're probably using the cloud. And with that comes a number of different considerations and kind of frameworks that you want to make sure you're implementing to make sure your cloud uh, infrastructure is securely controlled. Um, so first, identity acts and access management with fine-grained permissions. Again, making sure that you know any identities or rules you're using are very fine-grained and very tightly scoped to just the permissions they need. Um, and you know also, virtual VPCs configuration. So you have you know, your dev, your prod, your staging VPCs, all with proper network, network segmentation. So you know prod talks to prod resources, dev talks to dev, staging talks to staging. Um, you also want to do things like implement security groups and network ACLs for traffic control. So uh, traffic is only going where you explicitly allow it. Um, and then also making sure you're undergoing regular security assessments and penetration testing um, are all really crucial to running uh, operations efficiently in the cloud. Um, and then also with on top of that are you know kind of some container security best practices. You know, if you're running in the cloud, you're likely using containerized data. And here you're going to want to you know do things like use minimal base images with regular security updates, um, implement runtime security monitoring and anomaly detections for those containers before you deploy them, and also scan the container images for vulnerabilities before deployment uh, as part of your CICD pipelines, um, and always make sure you're using non-root users in container configurations. Um, but those are really all the best practices and you know kind of most high-level things I wanted to talk about. If I miss anything, please let me know in the comments or if you want to see a video on another topic. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you have a great rest of your day. There you go out.